So um, I had this whole thing about, you know, oh, this is going to be the most difficult talk of my life and I wanted to script it all and all this kind of stuff. Um, Ah, watching myself dissociate. Fascinating. And then this morning I found out that Rob Nan died. Which is like the perfect time to give this talk, really. Because all the, of the things that I'm going to talk about, Rob taught me. But also it's very hard. And, you know, I like giving talks, and um, I enjoy it, <clears throat> and I don't ever like to be on the page, but I'm on the page today just because I, I kind of need to read this rather than, than speak it. Um, so I guess the first thing to say is I, I didn't actually want to give this talk. I had planned to give my standard talk about lucid dreaming and death, uh, but Lama Zangmo specifically asked me to give a talk about my mum. And I trust Lama Zangma. And I know that she would only ask me to do it if it was for my highest benefit. And also, the last time someone asked me to give a talk that I didn't want to give was 15 years ago. And it was Rob Ben asking me to give a talk about lucid dreaming. And that one turned out all right. <laughs> yeah, Rob. Rob was like my Dumbledore. So my mum, I was very close to my mum, too close probably. I'd say things like, my mum is my best friend and I tell my mum everything. Even when I left home in my mid-twenties, I'd still go back and see my mum every week. I'd just miss her. And I thought that was normal. But after the last four years of Karuna Core Process Psychotherapy, I realised there's a term for this. It's called enmeshment. And psychologically speaking, enmeshment is a form of extreme emotional closeness in which personal boundaries become blurred. Now, this enmeshment with my mum made her death extra difficult for me because it wasn't just like I was losing my mum, it felt like I was losing a best friend as well. By the time she physically died earlier this year, I had managed to separate myself from that enmeshment, but the date of my mum's actual death compared to when I lost my mum is about three years out. How? Because both the blessing and the curse of Alzheimer's disease is that it gives you two deaths. The physical death, which for my mom was almost exactly nine months ago, and the energetic death, the death of their personality, which happened years before that. Weirdly, this meant that when my mom actually died, I wasn't heartbroken, because my heart had broken three years before then. It broke when she forgot who I was, when she forgot she was my mother, when she stopped seeing me as a child. That's when she died for me emotionally. That was like the first death. So although Diana Marchment died in February 2023, my mum, my mother, the woman who mothered me, the external mother archetype, died years before then. That's when my heart broke and that's when I started grieving her loss. And that's where this journey begins. Now, this talk is titled Guiding a Parent Towards Death. It was late 2015, at the age of 61, that my mum received the diagnosis of early onset Alzheimer's after finally being persuaded to go for the brain scans that would show what her friends and family had known for a long time or had feared. For over a year before then, she had been displaying what could only be described as bouts of extreme forgetfulness. I remember clearly the moment I first saw it beyond doubt. I was about to go and teach in South Africa with Rob Nan. And um, she gave me a birthday card to open later that month. I took the card and went into the bathroom to pee and when I came out she gave me another birthday card. 
with exactly the same statement about opening it on your birthday. I took the second card and put it in my bag, and then a few minutes later she came into my room and told me that she needed to get me a birthday card while I was away. I remember I went back into the bathroom and I screamed silently, which is weird to say unless you've done it, but it's possible. It was like the loudest scream, but nothing came out like in a nightmare when you can't make noise. It was that particular incident that broke through the thick shield of denial I'd been using to protect both myself and my mum from a truth that was too devastating to accept. I'd been fighting mum's corner for the past year, telling all the other family members that she was fine and that she did not have anything wrong with her. My love for her blinded me to the facts. I simply could not see it. And it was so hard to imagine because Alzheimer's was something that old people got, not someone as vivacious and beautiful and energetic as my mum. So my mind went into denial. Denial is a term we use a lot, but like, what does it actually mean? Huh. The brilliant Buddhist meditation teacher, Rob Nen. once defined it for me as a psychological defense mechanism in which the existence of unpleasant external realities is rejected and kept out of conscious awareness. He said that denial is similar to repression, but whereas repression relates to the internal, uh, internal psychological material, denial is based on external events. I was in denial. I was in the first stage of grief, denial, just as my mum was. For the first couple of years after her diagnosis of early onset Alzheimer's, her condition plateaued and she continued to live an active life with loads of people not actually knowing about her diagnosis. I'm not even sure that she was fully aware of her diagnosis. She was so deep in denial that she really did believe she was okay. My mum was an actress. She was a professional pretender, so she just pretended to be okay and I think she kind of believed that. But she wasn't okay. Of course, the first thing I did after the diagnosis is you turn to Google, right? And the Alzheimer's Association website said that the average timeline for early onset Alzheimer's from diagnosis to death was between four and eight years. I remember I literally laughed out loud when I read that because, you know, my mum was still driving. She was still going on holidays with her boyfriend. She was still doing the odd bit of TV work. She was 61, but she looked like she was in her late 40s. It was ridiculous, it seemed outrageous, literally incredible to believe that she'd be dead within four to eight years. And yet seven years later she was dead. Alzheimer's disease is often confused with age-related dementia and although it affects, often affects people who are older, in fact Alzheimer's is a distinct disease that attacks the brain in the same way regardless of age. In fact early onset Alzheimer's can often progress faster than age-related Alzheimer's. So if you get it at 60, sometimes it actually kills you quicker than if you get it at 80. So I'm here today to talk about helping guide my mum towards death rather than her Alzheimer's journey, but I want to give you a rough outline because it all leads to her death. About two years after her diagnosis, the symptoms started to show and she was unable to drive or travel by herself or cook or keep up her personal hygiene. So we coordinated her care through having a team of non-medically trained assistants, kind of like PAs we used to call them, who would come in and be with my mum for a couple of hours every day to help her with admin, you know, life admin stuff, getting showered, cooking. And these assistants, combined with the help of my mum's sister Jo, allowed her to maintain an, um, a kind of an idea of her independence for a lot longer than, than usual. These daily two-hour visits from assistants soon morphed into a whole team of assistants and helpers who'd be with her for 12 hours a day. Then this team eventually passed over to two live-in carers who were kind of with her 24 hours a day as the disease progressed. By this time, my mum had stopped speaking. Uh, and for the last year, she would like occasionally say things like yes or no, but basically she stopped speaking uh, for the last two years. And I'll never forget the last thing she said to me. She hadn't spoken more than a word for over a year. And we were sitting on a park bench in Kingston in the sunshine. And although she couldn't speak, she was always like fiddling with stuff. Uh, so I'd always get her things like flowers and feathers and she'd kind of hold them and fiddle with them. And I saw this feather on the ground. 
and was sitting on a bench and I gave it to her and she took it and she looked at me and so clearly and precisely she said the last sentence she'd ever say to anyone. She said, thank you, my little boy. You know, she did still know who I was. So the years of full-time care cost thousands and thousands of pounds. Uh, but we had, had power of attorney set up early, uh, so we were able to sell mum's flat to pay for her care. The power of attorney process is difficult for someone of completely sound mind. So the first takeaway I'd say is if you're working with someone with dementia or Alzheimer's, get the power of attorney thing done quick. Because the later you leave it, the more difficult it is. Our aim was to keep her at home until the end. After almost three years of full-time living care, her needs surpassed what we could offer her. Um, so for the last nine months, we moved her home in Thames Ditton. Although it was seen as the last resort, and I have fought tooth and nail against this with my brother, actually mum's time at Emberbrook turned out to be a great success. I was wrong. I was incorrect. This idea of like dying at home always being the best is not always the best. Look at the character profile of who you're working with. My mum was a socialite, so she had been stuck in her flat seeing the same two people every day for two years. Suddenly you moved her to Emberbrook and she was surrounded by new faces and a whole activities team and all the, I mean, she couldn't kind of do the activities, but they'd always bring her to the table for the activities and stuff. And this one wonderful time I came into her room and her bed was empty and made. And you walk into a care home and your, the bed is empty and made, you think the worst, right? So I'm like, fuck, where's, sorry, I'm like, oh, where's my mum? And I said, oh no, she's in the activities room playing um, uh, Gin Rummy, this card game. And I was like, mum hasn't, mum can't play cards. And I, I go there, and around the table, they've made a place for her, and she's sitting there, like, you know, zoning out, but they're moving the cards for her. And I was like, ah, oh, that's, that's what you get in a care home that you wouldn't get, you know, if she was in her, in her flat. Um, she started putting on weight because she was getting, like, three meals a day rather than the same things that the carers were cooking her. And they were wonderful carers, by the way, wonderful. I'm just saying it, this idea of moving them into a care home is sometimes a brilliant idea. Um, and the main thing was, the crucial thing, she was the only Alzheimer's patient on the wing. So this is the best choice we ever made. If you surround people with dementia, with others who have dementia, they stagnate. But if you can find a way to surround them with life people, they'll flourish. So if you ever get given a choice of a room like we did, we can put you in the Alzheimer's ward upstairs where she'll have very specific care, but everyone's zoned out. Or there's a room downstairs where everyone's just super old. You know, all our mates were like 90, two, two were in their hundreds and stuff, but they didn't have dementia. So we put her in that ward, and that's where she really flourished. That was a, a really good choice. Um, before we move on to mum's journey into death, I want to share, and it sounds kind of weird, but these like top 10 tips for caring for someone with Alzheimer's. Uh, and then later I'll read the poem that I read at mum's funeral, which again, Lama said would be a good idea to read. I kept these in my phone, like just over the years, just any time there was something, I was like, I'll write this down, this might benefit people at some time. So the first tip, and have their memories. However incorrect, don't correct them. Like, who are we to do that? And yet it's so natural to want to correct them. You know, I remember the one that sticks out is mum lived like near, near this park in Kingston, actually kind of in the park. And... One day she said that she had seen Mo Farah running around the park. And she kept pressing things. I saw Mo Farah running around. And I instantly wanted to go, no, you didn't. You're hallucinating. And because you're hallucinating, that makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't want to feel uncomfortable, so I'm going to reject your hallucination. Like, this is the psychological process, right? So then I thought, well, why don't I just sit with the discomfort of her hallucination and see a bit like a dream that can seem so... Um, so incomprehensible and yet always has some kernel of a, a fact or some kernel of creativity in it. And I was like, oh yeah, mum used to be a runner, almost professional. She had a choice between being a runner or, or an actress when she was younger and she stopped running. But she like ran for, the, for Britain and stuff like that. So for her seeing Mo Farah running around the park, maybe he's a symbol of something in her, like a dream, a waking dream. So let them have their memories. Number two, ask them to do things that they know how to do. Empower them. 
It's such a disempowering disease. You can't do anything anymore, yet there are some things you still can do. Mum could still help me with fashion. I'd do silly things like come in with two t-shirts. Oh, mum, I got taught. Which one should I wear? And her face would light up because she remembered about fashion. You know, she was a model. She was an actress. Or relationship advice. Oh, you know, George is having trouble with his girlfriend. What do you think he should do? She'd, she'd kind of thrive in those things. So find what they can do and empower them with it. Number three, never use sarcasm or underhand irony. They can tell from the energy of the words. They can be completely zoned out, but you take the piss out of them. They notice, they know it, they can feel it in the kind of power of the words. Just like you can tell when someone's insulting you in a foreign language, even if you don't speak the language, right? And yet the way we speak in front of people with dementia is if they can't hear us, making like gags about them. I mean, and I was so guilty of that in the early years. It's a coping mechanism. You're trying to kind of move yourself out of the discomfort of the situation. But now, looking back, I'd say, really, never do that. Never shame them. Number four, it's so unfair to embarrass someone for something they can't remember doing. When I would shame mum in the early years, say, oh, you said that three times in a row, mum. Five minutes later, she wouldn't remember that I had said that to her, and she wouldn't remember the fact she had said something three times in a row, but she would remember in her body the feeling of shame and the fact that I gave it to her. Number five, I don't know who told me this, some Buddhist teacher who was such good advice, they said, try and see your mum as a Buddha of forgetfulness. Come to teach you patience. Patience, impatience is one of my worst mind poisons. It kind of still is, but I'm so much more patient than I was seven years ago. So much more patient. Mum gave me that gift of learning how to be more patient. Number six, learn about anticipatory grief. I had never heard this term before. Learn about anticipatory grief. They die to us in part the moment they stop knowing who we are. And so you may be grieving their death two or three years earlier, two years or three years before they actually die. And I wish I'd known that. Psychologically speaking, this is the term is called anticipatory grief. And it can often be even worse than standard grief because the person's still there. So it becomes a very complex grief. You're like, why am I feeling like they're dead, but I can still visit her? So it's, it's much more difficult for the psyche to process and difficult to explain to others. Number seven, it hurts and it doesn't get easier. But the arms with which you carry the grief get stronger. It's like it doesn't get any easier, but it's like weight training. You're kind of... I heard something on the radio today about a weightlifter back in ancient India who would carry a calf, a baby cow. Every day he'd carry the baby cow. And of course the baby cow would get bigger each day and his arms would get bigger as he, and he became like a great weightlifter. It feels like that. It's not that it gets easier, but the arms with which you hold it get stronger. Number eight, when they lash out or say crazy things, try and imagine they're having a bad trip. That's really good. Literally, because they are. Like, try and imagine they've taken, like, too much acid or something. And imagine if you're with a friend who's tripping on acid and having a really bad time, how would you treat them? You wouldn't tell them, oh, you're making it up, you're stupid. You'd be like, oh, okay, you're seeing things. Okay, so your reality is you're seeing that. Okay, I'm with you. Let me enter into that reality and hold your hand. Number nine, you may find it actually gets easier as the disease progresses. And because you grieve in stages, the end might not be nearly as hard as you think it is. And finally, kind of what I've touched on before, but they can't remember what you say, but they remember how you make them feel. I believe that's an Angela quote, actually. Brilliant poet. So make them feel loved. Touch them, hold their hand, make them laugh, sit with them even when they don't seem to know that you're there. Because part of them does know. And it's very happy to know that you're there with them. So on to my mum's death. Like my mum died, so it was the worst thing ever. But it was the least worst thing because of what I was able to do to help her through the dying process. Because she had such a good death like Lama Zangma was teaching on. Her good death began for me with those final words. Oh no, with my final words to her. 
So ever since diagnosis, like seven years before I had this thing, I, I used to never say I love you to my mum, or rarely. I felt embarrassed by it. I felt because we were enmeshed, saying I loved her was like weird. It was, it was strange to say it. But since her diagnosis, I said the last words I will say to her after every visit are I love you. So if she dies, those are the last words she heard. And weirdly, the last time I saw her at the care home, I was just feeling like playful and she was kind of quite alert that day. So when it came to saying goodbye, I didn't just say I loved you. I did this thing where I started listing everyone that loved her. I went, I love you, mom. I love you. Matt loves you. Dad loves you. Joe loves you. Larry loves you. I just listed all these, just being silly. And she was kind of going, oh, kind of like <laughs> responding to each thing. And as I left that evening, I clearly remember thinking, if she were to die tonight, I can't think of any better last words for her to hear from me. Now, she didn't die that night, but she died a few nights later, a few days later. And I was so glad. I was so happy. There was no regret there. Imagine if, if, imagine if I'd have lost my patience the last time I spoke to her or, or forgot to say I love you. I was as prepared as anyone could be to guide my mum towards death. I've been a member of the Bardo group for the last more than 10 years. I'd had the honour of offering prayers and chanting um, at people's funerals dozens of times. Uh, I was trained in how to help someone who was dying. I'd helped organise these events. I'd also done the Buddhist chaplaincy training uh, with Kalani Mitra and had been a celebrant for two funerals and probably more importantly, already helped two people uh, through death. Oh, and I'd spent the last 10 years writing books about lucid dreaming, right, which have this direct link to the death and dying process. But my point is, after all this training, I had always wondered, maybe it counts for nothing when it's your mum. Maybe the grief is just so overwhelming that that counts for nothing. But it turns out the training did pay off. It did pay off. Every minute I'd spent at the Barter Group meetings, every time I'd attended lectures at days like this, all the chanting at funerals, it all counted. It was all worth it. You know, just like the person who trains martial arts and then in the moment of conflict, when they need to protect themselves or others from harm, instantly moves into the, into the defense. It felt like that. At the most practical, basic level, when I went into that hospital room and I saw mum lying there recently dead, it was not the first time I'd seen a dead body. It was not the first time I'd smelt a dead body. It was not the first time I'd been alone with a dead body. It was not the first time I'd sat by a dead body and done the prayers. That really counted for something. There was no shock. The training paid off and I was able to help my mum journey into her death. So what does this kind of journey into a good death look like? If we look at it through the prism of the bardos, as Lama Zangmo was talking about, and I'm sure she said, you know, bardo is a Tibetan term meaning place in between or intermediate space. And... The death bardo, there are kind of three three death bardos. And it said the first bardo of death, as she explained, the painful bardo of dying, begins when you meet the causes and conditions that lead to your eventual death. So like if you're in a car crash, the first painful bardo of dying might be very short, you know, between the moment that the car doesn't break and you, you hit the wall and you die. But for mum... It was as if she'd been in the painful bar of dying for like the last year, maybe longer than that. So if we start it from then, the way I was guiding her was to dedicate prayers and Buddhist practices for her because she had no way of doing them herself. So if you're working with someone who's a Dharma practitioner, to dedicate prayers on their behalf is no less than them doing them themselves. Why? Because there is no other. You know, if you believe in dedication, dedication only works on a basis of non-duality and oneness. So to dedicate prayers for another and then think it's less because they didn't do them themselves is to completely negate the source of the prayers. So do prayers for them, dedicate them on their behalf. I also made sure I was regularly visiting, making sure others did too. Um, Made sure she was on the prayer list at the Buddhist center. Again, anyone who's dying or ill, send an email to the Buddhist center with their name and they'll be put on, you'll hear their names read out today when we do the prayers. But to be honest, because the Alzheimer's has so decayed her brain and mental functioning, it sounds strange, but I was actually looking forward to the moment she went into the second death bardo of actual, actual death. Because it said in the second death bardo, we, the clear light dawns 
And it said that the power of the clear light like wipes, wipes the slate clean of the consciousness. So, for example, Rob Nairn, when he died last night at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, this morning at 3 o'clock, um, all of the cancer and the effect the cancer had had on his brain and his ability to maintain consciousness will be, will be wiped clean by the dawning of the clear light, meaning that all of his connection to the teachings, all of his knowledge of lucid dreaming, all of his ability to maintain consciousness, all of his connection to the teachings are, are back, back online. So for the next 49 days, that he has access to this. And the same with my mum. You know, when she died, I knew that that would mean the slate of her consciousness is wiped clean. And all of those, that Alzheimer's that was preventing her maintaining lucidity was, would be wiped clean. And suddenly her ability to lucid dream, her connection to the Dharma, her meditation practice would kind of be back online, as it were. So I knew that when she actually died, that's when I could start helping her. When she did die, it, it did come as a shock, though. Um, she was pretty stable at the care home. And she seemed genuinely happy there. She wasn't agitated. She was always smiling. The staff really loved her. They even like took a day off to come to her funeral. She had advanced Alzheimer's. So, I mean, she couldn't talk. She couldn't walk. She couldn't eat. She was like zoned out most of the time. But she was stable. So it was a shock when she died. I was out of town when it happened. It was such a crazy synchronicity. I was traveling to the Isle of Wight on my way to a retreat entitled Healing the Mother Wound dealing with the loss of the mother. And I'm on my way to this retreat when I get the call. And also that retreat was on the Isle of Wight where all my ancestors come from. It was just so, a bit like Rob dying today on the Embracing Death and Dying Day. Mum dying that day seemed correct somehow. Or it's that thing, isn't it? That meme on Instagram. Everything happens for a reason. And if it doesn't, we will create one retrospectively. <laughs> So within about two hours, uh, the first time my auntie called and my mum was hospitalised, she was dead. So it was, it was really quick. It was actually a pulmonary embolism, probably from being in the wheelchair the whole time. So it was, again, it was the worst, but it was the least worst. It was a quick death. And my auntie Jo, her sister, was by her side when she died. And I was able to get back in London within a few hours to be with her, to do the Buddhist death rites by the body, all the prayers and all of that. Um, so the first thing that we did when I heard the news, was to ask my auntie, just like Lama said, to ask if they could not touch the body for four hours. So there's this idea that a medical death and kind of the, the view of death in Buddhism is, is not quite at the same time. That actual death, when the inner energies are gathered and eventually the full separation from the body, can take up to four hours. So the idea is not to touch the body for four hours because you give time for these, these processes to occur. So my auntie was so good. She played the kind of chaplaincy card. Uh, she went, oh, her son's a Buddhist chaplain. Uh, and, and I turn up like this. Like, Where's <laughs> yeah. Um, she's like, her son's a chaplain. Uh, this is in her end of will uh, directive, all this kind of stuff. Uh, please make sure that we, we don't touch the body. And she was so good. Her and my cousin Max literally stand guard by her body. They said every hour the guy with the gurney thing tried to come in and take her body and every hour they said no and they waited for those three hours till I came I just made it in time for that four hours uh, or between that time and when I was traveling back the first practice I did was Tonglen um, for those of you who know how to do it or even if you don't learn how to do it Tonglen is one of the most accessible and powerful practices you can do for someone who's ill dying or dead so Tonglen is a Tibetan term that means giving and taking and it's the name of the Buddhist meditation practice in which we imagine taking on the suffering of another person in the form of dark smoke and then transforming it and sending them healing energy and love in the form of this white light. In fact, because I was on this way to the retreat, we were told you had to bring like a framed photo of your mum to put on this mother shrine at the retreat. So I had it with me. So I was like, perfect. So I got the photo out and started doing Tonglen to the photo. So I guess this is the first practical, another practical takeaway. Any time you hear that a person is suffering, you can offer them Tonglen. You don't need to ask them. You don't need to ask for permission. You just do it. T-O-N-G, Tong, L-E-N, Tonglen. So if you're watching the TV, you see someone suffering, do Tonglen to the TV. If you're sitting on the tube and someone offers it, you look sad, offer Tonglen. Again, it's not like the shamanic tradition where you should ask permission to send healing. 
Buddhism is like, just send healing. There's, there is no other, right? You're just sending it yourself. As Pema Chodron says, Tonglen can be done for those who are ill, those who are dying or have died, those who are in pain of any kind. It can be done as a formal meditation practice or right on the spot at any time. So after doing Tonglen, the next thing I did was contact Lama Zangmo and the Bardo group. So again, this resource is here. If you're with someone who dies, ring the Buddhist center, let them know, and people can start doing prayers. Like, as the Bardo group, as a Bardo group member, you'd be so surprised when we get an email out saying, this person's died. There are all these emails come out, okay, I'll start doing prayers for them. And then we say, oh, this person, there's a funeral next week, who can come? And we're always up for it. You know, we have this training, we want to offer it. And it's an honor for us to do the funerals. So, do Tonglen, then I spoke to Lama Zangmo, then I contacted Lama Yeshe Rinpoche to make sure Mum had prayers done for her and the POA practice. Again, no time to go into that, but a certain practice, the very good for people at the time of death. So, within hours of Mum's death, there were groups of people doing prayers for her, offering her candles. I really felt the support of the Sangha. You know, this idea of that third jewel, the Sangha, those who walk with you on the spiritual path. I felt so held that day. And then I arrived, and I opened the door, and there was my mum in a room on a bed, dead. And there was no shock. There was just a sense of, I've done this before. I know what to do. And I did it. So the first thing I did was to whisper in her ear the three instructions as taught by Akon Rinpoche, have no fear. Everything you experience is the projection of your mind and go towards the bright white light. There are so many Bardo instructions, a whole book, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, written on it, and yet those three instructions seem to be the core ones. Have no fear, everything's a projection of your mind, go towards the bright white light. Next, if I had had one, I would have unfurled a mandala blanket. So a mandala blanket is like a big piece of uh, cloth with all of these Buddhist mandalas and prayers written on it, and you lay it over the body. You kind of position it over the chakras. It's like a, like a shroud. Imagine the kind of shroud of Turin things, like thin, thin material with these Buddhist prayers and, and mantras on it. Now, I didn't have one at the time, um, but I knew that because she was having poa done by Tai Situ and Lama Yesha were doing the prayers, we were kind of okay. But the mandala blanket would have been really good to place on her body at that time too. It said the mandala blanket leads to liberation upon touch and that if these specific mandalas and prayers can be placed in contact with the body soon after death, then the person will certainly reach enlightenment. And then I did the bardo prayers, um, some of which we'll do later when we do the, the light offering, and then I think we come back in here and do the prayers, the similar prayers to that, a certain set of prayers that are like the ones you do when someone dies. And inevitably I made mistakes and I mispronounced mantras and I, I got bits wrong, um, but I did it to the best of my ability. And I did it from the heart. Then I lit candles and made offerings. It says this 49-day bardo period, the person's consciousness is like nine times more powerful. It's interesting, they say in the lucid dream, your consciousness is seven times more powerful. In the death state, it's nine times more powerful. So if you're doing chants in different languages, if you're just thinking of them, sending them love, so like if we all send love to Rob Nair now, he can feel that. They have full psychic capacity. So I made lit lights, did offerings, and then for the next 49 days, I did the Bardo prayers every day for 49 days. They weren't long, it only took about half an hour or something, but I made sure I didn't miss a day. So every day I was checking in, doing the prayers, making offerings. And then once every seven days, I was doing, uh, coming here and doing the light offerings that we'll do out there to the 108 butter lamp offerings. And then on the seven times seventh day, the 49th day, I came here and did offerings again, and then like a final ceremony. So there were things I could do. I don't know if they worked. You know, how do I know? I have no idea if they work. Maybe it's all a big cosmic joke. But even if it is, and I said this to my brother who's quite sceptical of this stuff, I said, even if it is a big cosmic joke, this whole 49-day journey, what a brilliant psychological mourning process they've created. And I'd, I bet someone one day will do the neuroscience that shows like after seven weeks after grief, something starts to shift or something's integrated, you know. Even if none of it worked, it worked for me. Yeah, so that's it. So that's my, my talk about guiding a parent towards And then now I'm about to do that process again 
with not my blood father, but a man who was a father to me, absolutely. So tomorrow I'll fly out to South Africa, and then on Saturday it'll be his funeral, where I will do something, and I'll continue these same prayers for the next 49 days. Again, there's things we can do. You know, there's actions we can take. It's, again, in both mum's case and Rob's case, now that they're dead, there's actually more ways they can be helped because their illnesses were blurring their consciousness. But once they hit the clear light after kind of medical death, bam, their consciousness is free from that. So we send them love. Have I got time to do this poem? I've never not wanted to see a Nord (laughs) any more than that. So there's a poem, again, it's so weird. If anyone else had asked me to give this talk, I would have said no. I was like, no way. Like, super triggering. But because Lama Zangmo asked me to do it, when the Lama asks you to do something, you know they're asking you at a different level. There's something they see. And the fact that then Rob died this day. I'm not saying Lama foresaw that, but I don't know, maybe there was something. Who knows? And she also told me to read this poem. called The Longest Heartbreak. I am not heartbroken. My heart broke years ago. It broke the first time she couldn't remember my name. It broke the first time and she turned it broke the first time she turned to me and asked if I was her dad. To which I replied, yes. What else could I say? And in that moment I saw her reunited with her long dead father through my eyes. I'm not heartbroken. My heart broke years ago. It broke the time she said she would run away because she knew that something bad was happening all around her, but she didn't know what. It broke the time I gave her a feather I'd found on the ground, and after months of not speaking, she said the last full sentence she would ever say to me. Thank you, my little boy. She broke the time, my heart broke the time she finally accepted her diagnosis, and with acceptance came despair, and with despair came the nightmares. So I slept in bed with her that night, watching over her, standing guard as she slept, ready to slay dragons for her, just as she had done for me so many times before. The roles get reversed with this disease. Son becomes father, and mother becomes child, and while you're grieving your loss, you hold a baby in your arms that has the same face as your mum. And that's what messes you up the most. So my heart broke years ago. It broke in ages every few months for the past few years, but with each break, at least I could grieve by degrees, gradually. Alzheimer's disease has a lining of silver so thin you can barely see it, but it is there. It breaks up the grieving process. They don't leave you all at once. They leave you in little pieces. Each one a little death. And for each of those dozens of little deaths, I had dozens of little funerals. So this is not my first rodeo. I have mourned the loss of this woman for years. I idolised my mum. When you grow up seeing your mum on TV and watch audiences applaud her on stage, it's bound to change the way you see them. And it did. At a young age, I came to see her more as the goddess than the mother. That's why I couldn't see the disease when everyone else around me could. I was hoodwinked by a love that was probably a bit too close. It was only when I was stood holding three birthday cards in my hand, all three given to me within five minutes, that I finally believed it. She gave me each one of those cards as if it was the first time. And each time it was a bold underlining of what they had been trying to tell me for so long. Something's not right with your mum. Not right. One of the many kind euphemisms that people, including my mum, would use to avoid saying the A word as if it were a swear word, as if to utter its name would make it somehow real, as if not naming it would protect her from the pain she felt from it. And no wonder, Alzheimer's is the worst. It is the longest heartbreak. You become the passive observer of death by a thousand memories, and like watching a child having a nightmare, all you can do is whisper love into their ears and hope they can hear you. So I would hold her hand. 
and tell her that I loved her and I would brush her hair and put lipstick on her lips and feed her blueberries and we would dance. And I would do everything to try and make her laugh. Because I missed the sound of it so much. But today I'm not heartbroken. My heart broke years ago. I love you more than the moon and the stars. And I'm happy that you're free. Don't worry about me. Go towards the brightest light you can see. Thank you.